Welcome everyone. My name is uh, Jakub Werdiger and I'm the Business Development Manager at Doron Aerospace. Thank you for joining us today. We greatly appreciate your time and it's our goal today to provide you with a clear picture of what makes Doron Aerospace so special. Communication with our family of investors is extremely important to us and we strive to be as transparent as possible across multiple channels including social media, our weekly flight notes newsletter, and update on Start Engine. Doron Aerospace stands at an inflection point in history where multiple innovation platforms, including energy storage, robotics, artificial intelligence, creating a perfect storm for the development of electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Five years ago, this would have been considered science fiction. But as we speak, Doroni is developing a personal evital, which we believe will change the marketplace forever. We are proud to be true leaders in this segment and to be offering a powerful, efficient, and, frank and frankly, beautiful design with the H1 evital. I hope you don't mind if we're less formal in our conversation and discuss things as they are. We stand we started, sorry, our current race on Start Engine with intentionally low valuation. And we have been extremely successful so far in creating a high value investment opportunity. But as we will elaborate over the next hour, the company's current valuation will disappear in just 29 days. And once it's gone, it's gone for good. Frankly, I believe this is to be opportunity of a lifetime on par with investing in the early days of Tesla back in 2006. Important, now during the webinar, please type your questions directly into the Q&A chat and we will address each one as they are received. And now I would like to introduce you to the main behind the tool. Uh, our CEO and founder, Doron Merdinger, what I, which I personally appreciate it, and what I think is the most interesting about the leadership and the vision is the fact that he can lead such a complicated uh, journey with almost zero ego. With Doron leading the company, success really is our, the only option. Doron, please go ahead. Money on mute. Thank you, Jakob, for your kind words and welcome everyone. I would like to divide our discussion into three main topics. Before we go into that, I would like to add that um, we feel that we're at a point of time, almost similar to the, to the before the launching of the first iPhone. I think what we're gonna be introducing is, is, a, is more than a game changer in, in, in transportation. So the three main topics we're going to talk about is development and production, partnership, and valuation and fundraising. Development and production. Let me share my screen. So you all, most of you should be already familiar with our design. This is how the H1P1 will look like. And now let me try to get you behind the scene of how we see it. So we have the, the structure inside the frame, as you can see, is made out of carbon fiber tubing. Basically, most of the Rony H1 will be made from carbon fiber composites, um, the two pilots. We have the motors, uh, eight here four or two in each duct and two pushers in the back. Uh, we already have the batteries. The batteries um, are already made. Uh, we made them in-house. So they are ready for this one. Um, and we have the landing gear. And I would like to have um, our, uh, our chief aerodynamics and mechanical engineer, uh, Roman Antono, to, uh, to add and explain a little bit more about behind the design. Uh, thank you, Doran. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, 
what's the idea to make structure of H1P1 in that way? Uh, the main idea was to make it simple, uh, easy for changing during the test because maybe something must be improved. Also easy for repairing and changing batteries, components inside, and easy for transportation. As you can see, H1P1 like have three main parts. It's front frame, cockpit, crew cabin, and rear frame. So everything can be disassembled in these three main parts and put on the some trailer or box and can be moved to some fields for testing or some showroom for exhibition. So uh, also we have a place for additional weight on the back on rear frame. It's for remote pi test without pilots. So we can put some uh, cargo there to compensate the center of the mass of the device of changing because there will be no pilot inside for some tests and we still need to have balanced vehicle. So that's why everything uh, have some purpose. Everything is easy for assembly, and we already started to do it, as you saw on some video updates from our team. And nearest time, we already will uh, start to do crew cabin and assemble everything together. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Roman. Um, I'd like to add. The, what you see here is uh, H1P1 prototype, but in fact, we are already developing parallel to that, the go-to-market product. Um, the reason we're doing both of them at the same time is because we learn and iterate, learn and iterate, and the go-to-market product will look similar, but it'll be, um, um, it will not look identical. It will have different uh, features and will look, will look a little bit different. Um, the entire concept is basically of the H1 is to, or as, as Roman said, is to simplify the inherent complexities of flight and to make it accessible to everyone. Our approach is truly democratizing flight. And I would like to have our pilot, test pilot, Charles, to add a couple of words so he can uh, help you or help us understand a little bit more uh, about the, you know, the concept of flight and what are we talking about? Charles, please. Daron, thank you very much. Uh, hey guys, my name is Charles. Uh, I've been a pilot for the past 25 years on commercial aircraft, flare jets and so forth. Um, you know, the, the guys we're working here, very intelligent, very smart guys. We've got a good thing going here. Um, we've really, really innovated the complexities that typically come with aircraft, simplifying the controls, um, less buttons, no rudders, highly automated. Um, everything's really coming together. Um, and if you guys don't mind, I see there's a, a question from Jack Armstrong. It says, so Joby's already there with a working product. How do you plan to compete? Really, Joby is a commercial product. We're not going for the commercial side. This is going to be something that, you know, you park in your backyard, your garage, things like that. Joby's working on commercial uh, aircraft, uh, not anywhere near an all-bar park. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to cover, and I really think that's about it, guys. Wrong. Maybe a little bit about maybe maybe a little bit about uh, the controls um, or the sticks. If uh, you want to explain a little bit, but sure. what we yeah, sure. The controls are going to be very simplistic. Uh, we've got two side sticks, one on the left side, one on the right side. Um, buttons to control your communications, your uh, autopilot, things like that will be there. Um, similar to a helicopter, you push forward to go forward, you pull back to go backwards. Left would turn the aircraft to the left, right would turn the aircraft to the right. Um, no rudder pedals, that'll be controlled by automation. Um, no complex switches, no throttles, everything will be controlled by the aircraft uh, upon your input. 
Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, guys. Um, basically, our approach is, uh, our entire approach is working with the most reputable companies to integrate their component components into the H1. Um, the next stage for the one is to finalize our go-to-market aircraft, the H1 that I mentioned before. Uh, we are seeking approaches for light sport aircraft uh, certification with FAA, but we also have other options for certification that are currently uh, on, available for us. Um, moving forward, our project launch um, in the second half of 2024, we're reviewing a few different options for production, including partnering with Space Florida and aircraft manufacturers to build a, a production facility. Now, let, let us elaborate a little bit about partnerships. The Roni strategy is built on acquiring as many third-party uh, partnerships as possible and integrating them. We want to keep uh, the heart, soul, and core of the Roni within our facilities and leverage the experience of our partners to bring manufacturing to scale. Uh, EV tools are a truly disruptive and transformative technology that will redefine commuting in much the same way that the iPhone changed the way we understand communication. Because of this, it is absolutely imperative that we partner with communities and Toroni is already uh, in advanced discussions with airport communities and communities leaders in South Florida and other states. Two of the biggest partners, uh, partnership we have disclosed are with Honeywell and Garmin to incorporate their systems in components into the H1. We are also in discussions with the, Flor the Florida city and state officials and are about to sign with another big reputable strategic business partner. But that's uh, the extent uh, of what we're allowed to share at this moment. But trust me, once we sign, it will uh, pave the way for venture capitalists to join us with uh, ultimate goal for reaching a much higher company valuation. Valuation and fundraising. Speaking um, of our valuation, as we've disclosed, we've already received a 4 million investment offer uh, at a much higher company valuation. In fact, almost on a weekly basis, Doroni is getting offers for investment as high as 40 million, uh, yes, four zero, with very high valuations. I can't stress enough how carefully we are exploring and weighing uh, each of these offers. We're methodically seeking out um, the right strategic investor that will provide us with additional resources and capital that will speed our progress faster than even before. Than even before. Thank you uh, everyone for, uh, uh, for much for your time and attention. I'd like to open up the floor to answer any and all of your questions. Um, as Yaakov suggested before, please feel free to type them directly into the chat. Uh, our team and I are here to uh, address and clarify uh, almost everything that we can and possible to disclose. We are here for you guys. How is the, uh, we, are we do, we have any questions that we would like to, to start with? I can't hear. Yes, Doron, I see some of the questions are in the chat. Some of them is uh, under the Q&A, so I think we're okay. uh, gonna go between them. Okay. Um, um, okay, Chadwick, Rix, um, the, this concept is great. I, I know we are in early uh, in the process, but we'll eventually would hope to have a product to accommodate more than two seats. Yes, definitely. Um, let me explain a little bit about our philosophy. Um, Charles mentioned that. We saw most of the players, the big players, are going to the air taxi. Air taxi requires a lot of uh, uh, complications as far as engineering and most of it as far as certification. Because it's not just to create a very durable and safe product and efficient, but it's also getting the communities to accept that. Uh, so there are multiple of things going on. Our belief is that at the end of the day, as most of form of trans transportation, we understand that 
people will commute with their own Doroni. Um, there is basically almost no limitation, technological limitation today, why a person cannot go into a, a, a Doroni today or another uh, um, uh, eVTOL, personal eVTOL and go vertical. So we see this is the future. Obviously, it takes time for the community to accept. So our approach was let's already, you know, have our aim at getting this as a personal aircraft. Uh, so for people can start to, you know, they're always a leaders in the market and, you know, we would like to already reach out to them. And in fact, we've get many offers or many uh, requests to be on our uh, orders list or pre-order list. So we have a growing uh, uh, pre-order list. And in a month or two months, we should have it on the website so people can start, you know, register for pre-orders. But in fact, we understand that we're starting with a two-seater. I think Tesla started with a Roadster two-seater. Our goal is to start with a two-seater, but eventually grow to four and five and maybe more. Um, once you prove technology, you know, with a two-seater, you just scale it up. So it shouldn't be a, uh, it shouldn't be, uh, a technological uh, uh, problem to do that for us, uh, but we need to start somewhere, and this is how we started. Thank you for your question. Um, okay, um, looking at the streamlined surface of the aircraft, it is not clear how batteries could be changed quickly and easily. Thanks. Um, maybe Roman, you would like to uh, um, address this answer. Yes, Alberto, question, thank isn't? you for um, this question. So uh, what you see on our uh, 3D model now, it's H1P1. It's uh, some kind of compromise and batteries are installed in the frame. They will be removable or, you know, swappable when you uh, like take out some part of the skin of the uh, Body. If drone can share the screen, I can even show you the place. Yeah, let me and do that for battery. a second. Yes, go ahead. Uh, on the back, you can see one battery is a little bit angled, like from other side. It's especially we try to show that when we will take out the skin of the wing, it will be big one part, which easily uh, this possible, we will take out the batteries. The same process will be on the front frame, but, and the second option, it's like we can work with batteries when we can disassemble it, uh, front frame from the crew cabin and back frame from the crew cabin. So everything is modular and there is a lot of rooms around and a lot of access, like ways to access to the wires, batteries, and other components. It, it's technically oh. our main purpose, to make it easy. I would so, like to add to that, that uh, as I uh, explained before, this is H1P1. It's not the final go-to-market product because we are learning from this as well. Uh, once it's completed, and we will do the proper changes in our final go-to-market product. Yeah, one of the purposes of this model, like in the end of developing and test, it looks like we will drop test it. So it will be even disintegrated. So we will learn what we need to change in the final product to make it even safer before we will go to certification process. Thank you, Roman. Um, I'm Edward and I have interest in your company and would like to know about the idea of trans transport before takeoff. Uh, will the wheel turn to maneuver uh, in and out of the garage space or if the aircraft is going to be drivable uh, as uh, to get to the area where the craft can actually take off? Maybe Roman, uh, maybe this you should address that as well. Yes. Uh, Edward. So of course, the, Edward, thank you for your question. So uh, yes, uh, the runway will be transportable from garage space to the uh, like takeoff and landing area. It will be done in two ways. First of all, you can uh, you will drive it uh, using the pusher props, and wheels will be easily turning. So and you can turn a little bit using brakes on the back wheels because each wheel will be 
with brakes. So when you push the brake on each side, you know, you using the joystick, it will be torn a little. And the second option will be the small electric motor in one of the front wheels, which will work as a, you know, like as a, as a motor in, in the car. But uh, how far you can go from your garage to take off and land in space, it will be also a question for a certification, which we will solve. And everything will be put in the manual of use. Thank you. Thank you, Roman. Um, don't go away because you have another question or, or you or Charles, please. Uh, it's from Steve uh, Widner. Um, uh, what would be the maximum wind velocity for safe uh, flight with the H1? I, I can answer it. Uh, please. Uh, the maximum wind velocity for safe flight for H1 uh, from technical side will be much more higher than 37 knots. But we have also certification uh, limitation, like uh, for LSA, which is as like our target, and there is a 37 uh, knots as a limitation for wind velocity for this category. That's it. Thank you, Roman. Uh, Charles, would you like to add something to that? No, Roman pretty much covered it. Uh, like I said, there's a limitation based on the, the category aircraft we're going for. Um, you know, it's also going to be a, a personal limitation as you're comfortable with the aircraft also. So if if the winds are just uncomfortable for the, the, the person that will be driving it, then that would be their personal limitation also. And each person's going to have their own. But as far as safety is concerned, we're going to make sure that we can hit the, the limitation for the uh, for the aircraft category that we're, we're involved with. Thank you, Charles. I would like to add something regarding safety um, because this is a new technology um, and you know we understand we're gonna be scrutinized, not us, uh, all the EVTOLs. So our intention and our belief that we can make the Droni H1 safer than um, maybe most, if not, you know, most of the cat of the aircraft, if it's helicopter or, you know, regular airplane, um, because we have so many things going on there that, and, you know, a regular aircraft will not have, like the helicopter, for example, have one motor and one propeller. We have uh, 10, eight goes vertical. Uh, so there are so many safety features and uh, like the parachute that you can see, I don't know if you saw it in the back here, but in the back, and uh, our, our goal is basically uh, to design um, so many uh, uh, redundancies as well that will make that thing uh, very safe and uh, you know, for, for, for people to engage and not just user-friendly, but also very, very safe. Um, thank you, um, let's see more questions. This is, uh, um, thank you, Daniel. This is my childhood dream come to reality. I love the design, it's very attractive design. Thank you. Um, thank you about it. A uh, little bit think about design. Many years ago, I was asked, you know, sometimes you need to com you know, to comp uh, compromise between design and functionality. I don't believe in that. I believe that a good design is also good function. So, you, you know, when you see something like you saw it and like we see it and thank you again, we understand that this is a viable product. This will do what we want it to do. Um, so they go together. And this is, this is, this is also what the beauty that, that we get back. You know, we understand that this is a, a working, a good working product. Um, and another question. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, it's from Alberto, I think it's Alberto. Uh, thank you so much for your reply. Let me ask one more question. The three frames, uh, front, cockpit, rear, could be electrically disassembled uh, and assembled by means of quick connection and connectors. Um, Roman. Yes, uh, Alberto. Okay, small additional. Uh, there will be a screw and nuts connectors. Like we have some uh, brackets, which is fit easily, and you just uh, like block it by uh, nuts and screws. We choose this way because it's low risk connector 
easy to calculate how it will work, easy to do it. So like technically, like exactly what we need for prototype. Thank you, Roman. Uh, another question from Sony. Uh, hypothetically, is there a fallback plan if one of the blades were to stop functioning in meter? Yes. Um, we designed the drone. You see, uh, let me go to share my screen again. Um, so you can see that we have a duct with two motors. Um, our design or basically one part of the redundancies is that we have eight motors and you can land on four. So if four, up to four, depends in which duct, it depends what level, but, but yes, one or two motors or two propellers or three, up to four depends where we can still land. And this is another uh, huge safety feature that is not available from my knowledge in any other aircraft. Um, if somebody wants to add, Charles or Oman, please feel free to, to add. Okay, uh, just if everything will just shut down, let's imagine some situation, I don't know like how it can happen, but you know, it's life and something can be not predicted. We have a parachute, like a rocket parachute, which will save whole aircraft with passengers. So as a like plan B, if everything else will be just switch it off. Is that all? Thank you, Roman. Uh, okay, go ahead, go ahead, Yeah, let me just add to that because um, it's kind of a little bit of my area. So the autopilot will manage um, the uh, safety aspects so that we will, as part of the design, we will manage or we will add uh, certain levels of redundancies. So one blade fails, technically it can be other blades will still be able to um, uh, handle the aircraft uh, stability. So you, sh you should be able to land it. And as Roman mentioned, worst case scenario, if, if one leg goes away, then a, uh, a rocket parachute will uh, deploy. But um, again, there will be more. So we need to test these um, ideas and actually prove that it works. That's it for me. Thank you, Azar, uh, Chief System Engineer. Um, uh, question from Jack Armstrong. How do you foresee regular, uh, regulatory hurdles and neighborhood noise opposition affecting your time? Uh, let me start by talking about noise first. Uh, there's, a, there's a big question about noise. Um, my, simple ask, my simple answer is always is try to compare Tesla to uh, any other car which is not electric. You know, noise levels are, you know, you cannot compare because there's hardly any noise in electric motor. The second obviously is the, the, the maintenance, which is a big thing uh, in combustion engines. This is all electric. So maintenance is, you know, is almost in, is very, the cost is negligible. As far as uh, regulatory hurdles, yes, we understand that there are regulatory hurdles, but there are already uh, places when we, where we expect and we already have engaging, as we mentioned, airport communities. Airport communities in the US, um, I think in just in Florida, there's over 70 communities like that, where you basically have a, uh, your, your own airplane you know, next to your home and you, it's like, a, it's like an airport and you fly from it. In the United States alone, there are close to 800 airport communities. So think about this, and this is just one of the niches. Um, as far as, um, because the agility of the, and you know, the flexibility of the way it flies, um, and also we're not interested to fly at levels that will endanger aircraft. Um, you know, we are going probably a couple of hundreds of feet and so um, this is a, a, a will not endanger, as I said, aircraft and will not create a problem for certification. We also not going into major airports. And this is another hurdle when you want to certify an aircraft. One of the things is, are you going to a major airport? No, we, we have no need for that. And there are already few ways of certification that we can not disclose at this point because it's also something that we're working on. Uh, that can help us expedite uh, our, abil our ability to go into the market. Besides that, there is a lot of markets 
outside of the US that they don't have such a complication form of certifications. So for us, you know, the whole world is our market, is our potential market. Um, uh, I hope I answered that as much as I could. Um, next question uh, is Frank. How long it takes to uh, for a full charge? Uh, I saw it can fly uh, 60 miles. Um, how long it takes? So at this point, as of today, we're talking about you know 40, 45 minutes, 60 miles. But I can tell you that from our understanding, we are already in contact with battery companies and technologies will be available. This is how we estimate it. By the time we start delivering the, by 2024, the first already, um, we will have over an hour. And for people who fly, they understand that a 60 mile, or we will have probably over 100 mile, this is our target, a 100 mile range, it's comparable to about 160 mile range with a car because you, you basically drive, you know, you fly straight or you drive straight, you don't, you don't have any stops on the way, you're not going, you know, uh, in routes. Um, there are no pedestrian crossing and almost no obstacle. Uh, so, you know, this will be more, way more efficient. The battery technology is progressing in huge leaps. Um, there are solid state batteries. There are so many technologies already. Uh, Toyota announced, I think Hyundai as well, that they have those batteries. Um, the idea is what they're doing is uh, compressing more energy to per, per pound, per kilo. And we see it already. Um, the US uh, announced by 2030 that at least 50% of the car is going to be electric. So we have a lot of forces, a lot of uh, producers uh, going into battery technology, and we expect to benefit from that as well. Um, somebody wants to add something, maybe Charles, Roman, Zar? Yes, uh, I can add about uh, how long it takes for, for full charge. So yeah. our plan is to get like uh, from 20 to 80% of the battery in 15 minutes and full battery in half an hour. So we think like this time is totally fine. You know, it's, it's uh, really achievable by modern technology and with future technology, it will be like possibly faster. So that's our like goal and our target. Thank you, Omar, Roman. Uh, um, as far as technologies, Although we are basically introducing a new disruptive way of, co of commuting, um, the technologies are available and are constantly, in this day and age, are being, um, are being uh, progressed, developing faster and faster. If you guys remember the first iPhone, maybe it was holding 30 minutes. Now, you know, it lasts for days. So we understand it. this is how exactly all electric cars are gonna, you know, we're gonna benefit from that. And also EV tools like us are gonna benefit from that. And we definitely, um, we just signed another LOI with a, a battery company uh, yesterday. Um, so all that is working on such batteries that were able to bring this uh, uh, over an hour of flight even more. Um, at one point, um, we will jump in, partner with one of these companies when we start to produce uh, the mass production for us. Um, any questions? I don't see any more questions, I, I think. Oh, uh, I, I need to answer to Alberto. Uh, like, sorry for misunderstanding. I didn't add information for electrical connection. Yes, of course, we will be, it will be, you know, a little bit, not like one big bus uh, for each wire. But all the wires in front, back it, will be uh, co collected together. So it will be easy to, to like disassemble it and like, reconnect it again when we need it. Uh, a little bit about, uh, about the team, um, the guys that you see here. Um, I can tell you, I'm very honored to work with such a team. Um, I myself, uh, I'm, uh, I was born, I still consider myself a geek and a child. Uh, even my wife and my kids are laughing at me a lot of times. 
um, and um, and I enjoy that. I think a person that stopped being a child is starting to die, basically. And my intention is to, to maintain this curiosity and childhood, and that drives me. Um, I the team here of the people are really, I can say, geniuses in each of their fields, multitasking, good in communication, good at understanding and iterate and move forward. Um, each one of them, um, you know, I picked uh, and we had long relationship uh, for, for quite a while, for like five years, even more than five years. And we went through hurdles um, and a lot of challenges, especially at the beginning, when people thought that we are so crazy and there, there weren't too many also uh, parts available like motors and batteries. And we really started from scratch, but these people, you know, they went through and they, they basically delivered uh, each one of their parts. Uh, so I'm, I'm very proud of that. Um, as far as um, where we are now, um, we understand that at this point of time, um, as I said, the valuation that we are is, is, I won't say ridiculous, but it's very low compared to the potential. We uh, engage now a, uh, an evaluation company and we understand we're in a different ballpark. If you, can, if you see just the bigger companies, uh, some of them just started a year ago and the valuation is sky roof, it's incredible. Um, from here, we ending the, around the, the end of, uh, I think 28th of April. And uh, part of the reason is because we're getting more and more offers for Big Done. I think this is an opportunity of a lifetime, uh, definitely for, for my team, myself, and for all the investors. Um, we will be happy to answer any questions um, and we'll be, you know, to, uh, we are available as much as possible because we're also answering questions, but we're also developing uh, the most advanced vehicle in the world today. And uh, we're taking this job very, very seriously. I personally, uh, I'm working 24 hours. Um, I'm trying not to think on the weekend or basically on, on Friday night, Sabbath, uh, that I can get my head uh, straight again, but we are working very hard, all of us around the clock. And um, so anything you guys want us to ask, any questions, you know, even suggestions, we'll be happy. Uh, to consider. Um, I think another question, um, Edward, again, thank you for answering question. Last question. So the craft will bring itself down automatically before battery dying, correct? Yes. Um, and uh, the, do you have your own protocol? Zar, maybe you want to answer? Uh, it's your own, your own, uh, Edward's, Edward's question. Uh, Ed, Edward, thank you for answering question. Last question. So the craft will bring itself down automatically before battery dying, correct? Yes, and maybe Zara will elaborate a little bit more. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, wait, let me just, where, where is the question again, Alberto? The, there's gonna be protocols for, for this. Um, definitely, we gotta make sure that you land safely, right? And um, we would allow, alerts so you make sure that the pilot or the user will have enough time to sort of realize that you don't have enough uh, juice or enough energy to complete your journey or something like that but yeah it's definitely in a in a um, dashboard it will be yeah. it, will, it will be there automatic descent and audibles um I command the CEO and the team, thank you very much uh, for outstanding design and project due to what the team has explained. It seems the one h one has two times its required safety factor. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, which is more than most uh, structure, we, uh, structure we live in daily. My last question is how high can it fly? Um, it can fly, uh, I mean, Roman, I, I, let me answer that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank right. you for this question. Uh, like as maximum, the Roni can go up to four thousand feet. It's like the question in most of all in uh, 
a restriction of certification because you know LSA have some uh, limitation for uh, maximum altitude for flight. But most of the flights, they will be like a few hundred meters up to 1,000 feet, something like this. Because uh, is it like drone? It's a transportation for point to point. It's not for like long, like hundred miles trip for hours. It's something which you can use as a car. So like jumping from one point to another point, just saving your time and your efforts just in comfort you know some kind of like pre uh, pre pre teleport technology you know like pre teleport, pre -teleport technology, technology yeah, yeah. Pre teleport technology yeah in future like in star course, trek yeah, yeah of course like in the future we will have even more advanced technology but based on modern technology we can create the own and it's already a big step forward. Yeah. Um, thank you, Roman. Another question. Uh, are majority of, of your components made in the US? Yes, most of the parts are made in the US. I can't say everything, but most of them are made in the US. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, is it possible to ever, uh, Alberto, is it possible to ever brochure via email reporting for all main technical characteristics of drone H1? Um, we will definitely think about that. Um, it's a good question. Let us, let us, let us think about that. Uh, we don't correct. Yes, we will have, uh, we, we basically, I think we have the main characteristics already. Um, on the, yeah, on start engine, uh, but it will appear also on more and more in our website because we're updating our website and we can send something as well. Jakob, do you see the uh, question by Alberto? I think the answer is yes. Yeah, we have another yeah. question there. Yeah. Uh, no, are no, you no, going no. to have ESA certification in the, ne in the next uh, in future? The next future. Yeah. Uh, Zara, I think he's typing an answer. Yeah, I was in the middle of answering that question, actually. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, so let ahead. me just answer it live. Sorry, thanks. Yeah, um, we are currently engaged with the FAA and uh, we're closely, um, you know, back and forthing with them. And we, you know, we're following the industry um, closely and see what the development is in there. And uh, we found some awesome news about FAA and EASA having to join this um, certification process. So perhaps it might not just be an EASA certification anymore in the future. So it could be like a joint thing. So, which is a good thing, see? So it, it won't be a separate FAA certification. It will be a EASA, it will be a, a joint. So, um, that, but definitely from the impression that we're getting EASA is a little bit more um, ahead of FAA. So that's why um, perhaps the industry or the at least the FAA is uh, trying to join and uh, get a, a joint uh what's the word for yeah. it yeah they're trying to join together to come up with a sort of sort of path because they they definitely are aware or at least they appreciate this innovation happening in the industry so yeah thank you thank you sir <clears throat> uh, another question from jack uh um, what about environmental impacts, studies, and bird migration patterns? Uh, just trying to see what has been considered. If um, any of the team, maybe Charles or Roman, would like to help with this. I can answer from technical side, from the design side, you know, because uh, migration pattern or birds uh, migration patterns, it's like we didn't make, a, you know, like some researching about it because it's like it wasn't included in certification process because our main goal is technical test and certification process but from the technical side from the design we don't have open props like we have a pushers but it's from the front side it's covered by body so even if we will have bird strike uh, like like it won't damage uh, device and even if it's damaged device we have a safety protocol and uh, looks like with bird 
uh, everything, you know, like it's a big possibility that with birds, everything will be also okay because it's, you know, like very streamlined and flat design. And also the drone is not flying super fast. So the total energy of uh, impact won't be so high. And it's a big possibility that with bird, everything will be okay. Do you see another like question? Okay, do you want to see another question from Steve? Oh. Okay. Do you uh, thank you, Steve? Do you have thank you, everyone? Do you see the FAA keeping up with the eVTOL development and be ready with the regulation when you're ready to commercialize the eVTOL? Um, I believe so. I can't speak for them, but there are so many things going on and Again, FEA is not working by itself. It's working with YASA, and as Zara mentioned, YASA is a little bit more uh, you know, uh, advanced, and they're learning their back and forth from each other. And um, yes, the thing is, again, the technology is so readily available. And, it, and you know, just, just, just you know, watch what's going on now with the gas prices. The gas prices, because of what's going on now in the world, is you know soared, and it just makes the case for you know for for electric vehicle. But then again, electric vehicle are are for us the way I see it. And forgive me, big companies like Tesla are intermediary technology, because we are still moving on a two-dimensional plane, and there's a whole world above us. It doesn't mean that we need to fly at 10,000 feet. It doesn't mean that the sky is going to be heavily, you know, uh, uh, crowded. filled with the uh, crowded. Uh, it, it means that there is another world there that we're not using. And it just doesn't make sense to go and excavate and go underground. The only way, because the cities are condensed and it, not even a... Uh, a uh, autonomous vehicle can solve such an issue. The, all of them are, into, we have to go three dimensions. I mean, we knew that coming. Everybody knew it was coming for years. And the thing is the technology of today, as of this moment, you can already do it. So it's not a matter of if they will do it or not. If the, you know, it will happen anyway, because the technology is there and people are gonna be using it. Um, somebody wants to add something to my answer? Charles, I saw you nodding your head like this. So I was like, okay, do you want to add it, something? Is it to the Steve Wadner's uh, question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, from what we understood, uh, definitely FAA had um, uh, a recent reorg or transformation within the organization to handle this type of innovation. So that could hopefully speed things up. I mean, you know, FAA, they could be a a little bit slow sometimes, but um, you know, there's a lot of um, this type of innovation, a lot of players demanding their attention. So definitely they kind of need to uh, keep up. Uh, hence why um, that's probably what drive them to, you know, talk to Yas and be like, you, you can we kind of need to uh, keep up with you guys. See, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's probably what the reason why they they um merged or at least tried to see how they can um work together with Yasa to uh, keep up with the innovation that's happening in the industry. I would like also to thank you, Zar. Uh, I'd like to add that I think two months ago, about two months ago, the House of Representatives issued two new house bills supporting advanced air mobility. So there's an overall interest in the government, the federal government of the U.S. by itself, and there's all the whole world, there's Europe and other places as well that support um, advanced mobility, EV tools, what we're doing in the infrastructure and also in, you know, as far as design development. The, the technology is just no brainer. If you, if you, you know, have an aircraft that's flying above you, you hear that noise. And when you have a, an EV tool or drone at least, the, the it's the, there's no pollution to compared to to you know no noise and no pollution compared to what an aircraft is making so why wouldn't you use it if you can even we can make this the case that it's more efficient and safer 
and you know readily available. So you know everything is there just to put it together. This is how we see it. Um, I hope I uh, we answered everything. I don't see any more questions. Um, but maybe um, Yakov would like to thank you guys. Oh, will you be sharing a replay uh, of this webinar? Jeremy, yes. Will you be sharing a replay of this webinar? Uh, maybe Jakob will answer and we'll take us to closing from here uh, to uh, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Hall answer a question. So yeah, uh, thank you very much guys. Yeah, uh, yes, we definitely gonna share the recording of the webinar uh, through our newsletter and also to the campaign updates. So uh, you're definitely gonna see it in the next few days. Um, thank you very much for all, all of you. Uh, it's uh, very important for us. We feel honored that you participate in this webinar. Um, if you have any more questions, you know you can ask on the campaign page, uh, also in the info at Roni.io. Uh, um, I think for now we're going to say goodbye and good luck for, for us and good luck for all of us. And we'll see you next webinar. Thank you. Bye, guys.